Verse 12 begins with, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Petronian God to everyone else, so that most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Some, to be sure, are preaching Christ even from envy and strife, but some from goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition rather than pure motives, thinking to cause me distress in my imprisonment. And the last verse, 18, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ has proclaimed, and in this I rejoice. Now last week, we said there are three major points in this paragraph. Last week, we looked at the first part, which is, now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. So, that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the Petronian Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. And our point last week was we all know Paul's conditions. This is house arrest. He can't really leave the house. He's chained to a Roman soldier that changes every six hours. Hardly an ideal circumstance. And uh, from what I remember, I believe he was in this condition, house arrest, for two years. But I would have to check on that to make sure. This less than ideal circumstance, for a preacher nonetheless, right? we said was an adversity for Apostle Paul, but he found an opportunity within that adverse circumstance. And we said, lesson for us, if there is one, is there is opportunity in adversity. Now, and we said the solution, the, the way we get to we see the opportunity was to change our perspective about the adversity. And we used the example of the big wave that's scary to a person that doesn't know how to swim, creates incredible opportunity and joy for a surfer. It's the same wave. It's how you look at it. So how do we know how to look at an adverse situation? Most of you, even this past week, lived through stuff that I know that was less than ideal. You lived through adversity. Some of you came here with pain in your heart because of what happened last week. So what do you do with that? Are you, ki are you lying to yourself by saying, you know what, there must be some good in this? Or is that the truth? How do you know the difference? You know, in its core, this comes down to how much you believe God and who he says he is. How much do you think he loves you? Does he? Does he care? When you're hurting, is he there? Why does he allow it? Where is he when you feel like you need him the most? So when you're going through your struggles, your storms, in Paul's case, it was imprisonment. But throughout the whole letter to the Philippians, the guy is happy. It's called the epistle of joy. I couldn't do it. If I was in prison, I couldn't say, hey, this is a great opportunity to be chained to a Roman soldier, so I get to speak to him about Christ. That would have been my first reaction. God knows. 
Now, if there is a lesson to us in that, we are told that these kinds of perspectives does make a difference. And in the coming verses, in the next weeks, we will see what kind of a difference it, make, histor it made historically and culturally and in church history and so on. But in our lives today, in 2018 now, when you're going through your battles, what are you supposed to do? Do you kick back? Do you hit back? Or do you look for God's perspective? I assure you there is God's perspective in all things. If you were to take an inventory of your life and look back, when you had adverse situations, when you had storms in your life, when you were walking with the Lord, look how it ended up. What happened at the end? How did God move? I had to do that this week. I had to look back because there is a lot of things that I'm questioning in my mind. And like when I speak up here, I want to make sure that I'm talking about stuff that I have somewhat experience about. I just don't want to repeat to you what I read in commentaries and all that stuff. But I could tell you, there was a lot of looking back for me this week. And even though at times God doesn't feel like he's there, and the waves are about to crash, when I look back into my past, God did come true. Sometimes it was a lot better than I thought it could ever be. At times, it was a lot different than I thought it could be. Take a, Apostle Paul, for instance. God told him, I'm going to send you to, to, to Rome, and you're going to preach to the emperor there. I hardly doubt Apostle Paul, when he heard the Holy Spirit say that to him, thought that he was going to be, one, imprisoned, go there as a convict, be shipwrecked, Right? That wasn't his way. He thought he was going to go there as a free man and preach the gospel. And people were just going to come to the Lord. But God did keep his promise, but for reasons that are only known to God. He chose him to go there as a prisoner. Now this is the rub, isn't it? This is... The test of surrender in our lives. Am I okay to surrender to God to a point where he will take me to Rome as a prisoner? Or do I want to go to Rome on my own terms? Am I okay to surrender to God to a point where I could say, Lord, here I am. Do with me what you will. Am I surrendered enough? Or do I still want to play life according to my own rules? If you want to live your life according to your rules, I tell you, God will let you. But that's less than his best. And if you're his child, you're not going to be happy doing it. His ways are not our ways. You heard this a million times. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He's got a different way. Why redeem mankind by dying a gruesome death on the cross? I don't know. That's his way. I don't know. But I need to surrender to him. Lord, do with me what you will. You see, until and unless I fully surrender to him, I'm not really going to experience that Peace that surpasses all human understanding. There is still going to be that static between me and him. That's, that things are not going to sit well. And I'm just going to take my toys and leave at some point. It's about surrender. In Paul we see someone who surrendered. 
He's an example to us in many ways. So, adversity and opportunity. So, this was all last week, by the way. <laughs> this week, we're, I only have nine minutes left. When you're dealing with adversity in a way that honors God, others take notice and you make a difference in their lives. In this instance, Apostle Paul is saying, and that the most of the brethren trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. People that knew Apostle Paul was in prison and he was still preaching and people were being converted. They were emboldened somehow. Because don't forget, there was persecution of Christians at this time. According to um, one archaeologist, I forget his name, he, he found like a caricature or a wall art of first century that, that gives a pretty good insight of how people looked at Christians back then. Uh, they found this piece of wall with the etchings on it. The etching was cross with Jesus on it with a donkey's head. And to the left of the cross, there was an etching of some young people. And the description on the need said, Alexander is worshiping his God. You could just feel the disdain they had for Christians. Um, it was hardly an ideal circumstance. So people were naturally afraid. They were hesitant. But when they saw Paul reacting this way in prison, doing boldly what God told them to do, regardless of his circumstances, they were encouraged. They were emboldened. I read about this um, lady. Um, name wasn't given. She had a, a form of cancer that was really painful. But she was a totally surrendered Christian. She wasn't bitter about it. She wasn't just constantly talking in negative tones. She was not, uh, what's the word I'm looking for, dwelling and wallowing in self-pity. She was somehow still upbeat, joyful, and she was still praising God in her situation. Now at some point when the time came, this lady passed away. You're saying, what's the big deal? But at the same time, there was a lady right next door, her neighbor. She was not a believer. She was not a Christian. But seeing the true faith this lady had, she was converted. She did become a follower of Jesus. And her son made a huge difference. For he became a um, pastor, missionary. He brought the gospel to the Indians. He brought he wrote um, a few volumes of commentaries. He trained the countless pastors. I'm sure he's counted, but I don't know. He had a huge impact. Now, if, when this lady was suffering, she had no idea what was going to happen. She just did what she knew she had to do. Her perspective was different. In her adversity... She didn't choose self-pity. She chose to glorify God. And God used it for his purposes. Now, she couldn't have known what was going to happen 20, 30, 50 years later. And I must warn you about one little thing here. If you're going through adversity, and others are watching you, Please do God a favor. Don't pretend like you're okay when you're not. That's hypocrisy. And people can smell it a mile away. 
Don't do it so that others can see you and they think a certain way. That's not real. Don't do that. God doesn't need your help. Make sure what you're feeling and what you're doing is real. If you're embittered against God, don't act like you're not. If you don't like the ha hand God has dealt you, don't act like everything is okay. Because people can see it. And I have known believers like this. They act a certain way, but you know that that's not real in their lives. Don't be that person. God doesn't need our help. But constantly fight against those negative thoughts, those lies that are constantly bombarding us in our minds into giving up our peace and settling for less than what God has planned for us. When you go through adversity, others are watching. How you deal with it affects what happens to others. When you're going through adversity, there is an opportunity in there. How do you know what that opportunity is? Only God can tell you. I don't know. What does God want you to do in your adversity? I don't know. What, how does God want you to change your perspective about your situation? I don't know. But He does. Ask Him. He wants to tell you. Those of you that have children, when your child comes to you, ask for direction. Daddy, Mommy, how can I do this? What should I do here? Are you going to say, I go figure it out? No. <laughs> You're going to tell her. You're going to tell him. Same thing with our Heavenly Father. Most of the time, our problem is we don't ask him. We just tell him. Ask him. Lord, I'm going through this thing here. Whatever that is. Maybe it's more than one thing. And this is eating away at me. What is the right perspective in this? What do I do in this situation? What do I need to change my mind about? What is it that I'm missing in this? Tell me. Ask him. Spend that quiet time with him. It's just you and him. No one else. Nothing else. Him and you. In his word, prayerfully, meditating, maybe a good cup of coffee. You know? Just spending that intimate time with Him. If you don't do it, do it. It'll change your life. God will reveal stuff to you that you had no idea was there. And He does have a plan for you. He does. I know it sounds clichéic, but He has a plan for every single day of our lives. It's there for the taking.